Welcome everybody to the 51st talk in the University of Buckingham series of Great uh, Lives, Great Minds, and we have uh, uh, a truly great mind, one of the most uh, creative and thoughtful people uh, who has written in the last 30 years with us tonight, Anne Applebaum. You can see there uh, the cover of Anne's book published earlier this year. That's the American title. The British subtitle is The Failure of Politics and the Parting of Friends. We're going to come on to that. Uh, later, can I welcome everyone who's new to this series? We do like it to be interactive. I love to have your questions coming in and I will filter those in to Anne. It's very much a discussion uh, what happens. I'm going to be talking to Anne for uh, some uh, 35, 40 minutes. Um, we're going to have to finish a little earlier this evening um, and then um, uh, I will then start feeding your questions in properly. Please have them ready. If you are on a platform whereby you can't type in questions, please make a note of this uh, address. It is Matthew, Matthew dot Thompson, Thompson with a P, at Buckingham, that's the university's name, buckingham.ac.uk, matthew.thompson at buckingham.ac.uk, um, and uh, he will feed the questions through to me and I will ask them. So uh, here you are, um, optimistic uh, or pessimistic uh, as you look ahead, Anne? So I recently came to the conclusion that it is, it is irresponsible to be pessimistic. Um, particularly, and I should I should say I'm 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 grateful to be here, and I'm particularly grateful to be talking to students, um, because for me to say to people younger than me that I am pessimistic and I think everything's coming to an end, or you know the West is dying, um, or our civilization is crumbling, um, is a way of giving in to a kind of nihilism or despair, a kind of nihilism or despair that I write about in my book, um, and so I am. Um, although I, I probably have a my kind of naturally as a you know I'm somebody who's written a lot of books about gloomy subjects I'm I'm attracted to pessimism and to difficult subjects um, I remain optimistic about our civilization about our democracy about um, the you know the, the the many ways in which um, you know we can renew those things and 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 in particular I'm optimistic about younger people and the enthusiasm they have for public life so. So I'm optimistic. I've often thought that about you over uh, the years uh, reading you. Why are you attracted to uh, the dark, um, uh, the evil, the sinister, the repression, uh, the turning towards the darkness? Um, is that something in your own uh, background? Um, you were born in uh, um, July 64 in, in prosperous uh, United States under LB uh, Johnson uh, as president. Um, you had a, a Jewish background. Is that part of a legacy? Uh, why uh, the focus on what goes wrong in life has gone wrong in life? And will there be books in the second half of your life which are uh, fundamentally uh, looking at, at, at examples of human um, admirable behavior? <laughs> I mean, you're asking me something that I, I can't really answer. I mean, why one is attracted to subjects and so on. I mean, I can give you a post hoc explanation or a rationalization. I mean, in a way, I think it's almost the opposite of what you say. I, I did grow up in prosperous America. I had a pretty idyllic childhood. I had a very stable family. I went to very good schools. Um, you know, I didn't there, you know, nothing terrible happened to me. Um, but I, 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 I did have, you know, from a pretty young age, a, um, a deep interest in trying to understand why things do go wrong in the world and what, um, you know, how do you explain them? Um, I mean, the, you know, when I look back, I mean, the, I was very interested in Russian literature when I was in, when I was in high school. Um, I read a lot. Um, and that was part of what led me to study the Russian language. And then studying the Russian language was a kind of, you know, it's like a gateway into this, you know, um, an, an alternate world. Um, it was certainly an alternate world from the one that I grew up in. And I became um, fascinated by it and tried to understand it. Um, so in a way, it was a, it was an attraction to opposites, that thing, things that are different from me. 
Um, why is the, you know, why is everything not the way I see around me? Um, uh, you know, that, that, that's, that's the best explanation I can give. I mean, you know, maybe someday I'll, you know, I'll have a psychiatrist who can give you a better one. But, um, but I, 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 I think it was this, 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 you know, my world is, is so lovely. Why isn't everything else like this? I think something like that has always interested me. Well, you had a glittering um, uh, academic uh, success at uh, Yale and LSE and St. Anthony's uh, Oxford. You could have gone uh, in any uh, direction. Um, there was that allure of the East uh, pushing, pulling you back into the earlier parts of the 20th century uh, and the darker parts. Your family um, came from the former Soviet Union, uh, but but without any particular, from your parents' side, any particular love or desire themselves to go back to that? No, so to, to be clear, um, a part of my family did come from what was the Russian Empire when they left, which is in the late 19th century. Um, another part of my family um, came from what they remember as Alsace-Lorraine. I, I, I wonder now whether it was, you know, really just Germany. Um, um, and they have, a, but they do have, a, there was a French surname. Um, and they, and, but the main thing that, you know, I think is probably key about my family is that all of my grandparents were born in the United States. And on my mother's side, on the sort of French-German side, um, they'd been in the United States for many decades, you know, since the since the first half of the uh, 19th century, since before the Civil War. Um, and so we had very much a sense that we belong here and anything that happened in Europe, in Eastern Europe, um, you know, that doesn't really concern us. I mean, we forget now. I mean, now there's a fashion for discovering your roots and for feeling attached to wherever it was that your family came from. But when my parents were growing up, and particularly when my grandparents were growing up, you know, in the 40s and 50s, 30s, 40s and 50s, um, most Americans tried to, for, you know, Americanize as fast as possible and assimilate as fast as possible um, and to become, you know, really quickly, you know, as indistinguishable from everybody else as they could. Um, and so I grew up in a very, very assimilated family. I mean, we were Jewish and we knew that and there was, you know, we... We there. I had some Jewish education and so on, but it wasn't a. It was it, it wasn't an identity. It was a religion. I mean, it was a. We were we were Jewish and we were American and we lived in the United States and and probably being American was somehow more important. Um, I, I suppose I got more interested in, you know, I, I really confronted um, the idea of, of I don't know Jewishness as an identity when I first came to Europe and it interested people who I met in you know, particularly in Poland, but even in England, more than it had interested anybody that I met in Washington, D.C. growing up. I mean, it was just in, in Washington, D.C., it was one of, I don't know, you were Jewish or you were Catholic or you were something else and nobody really minded. But um, but in, in Europe, I did find that it attracted interest or it made people, you know, people ask me questions about it. And I probably became more interested in, in Jewish history um, a, a, as a result of that. And I mean, my books are not about specifically about Jewish history at all, but many of them, there are elements. Um, there's a, of course, if you write about Russian history, you write about Ukrainian history. Mm. If you write about Eastern European history, you come, you run across um, that subject and, and all the issues around it, um, you know, pretty quickly. And I, and I, in a way, educated myself um, about that history later on. I didn't grow up with it. I didn't grow up speaking any East European languages. Nobody in my family spoke Yiddish, let alone Polish. Um, nobody had any fondness or attachments to that part of the world. It was more, I went back and, and found it later on to the surprise really of my family who I think belatedly began, understood why it was interesting to me. It is um, it is fascinating what makes us have uh, the passions and the deep, deep interests in life that we have. And often it's hard to explain and understand. Was the visit that you made to the Soviet Union at a time of real transition after the death of Brezhnev in the summer of 1985 when you were just 21? I mean, was that in any way a formative experience? So, yes, that was a really important experience. I was actually a student in Leningrad. Um, when it was still Leningrad, before it was St. Petersburg. 
um, in the 80s. And if I remember correctly, I think Gorbachev had come to power. He was, but he was uh, not. There, there was Antropov and Chenienko, wasn't there, in quick succession, 84, 85. Right. And then he was emerging. Yeah, absolutely. That's right. That's sure. right. Um, but 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 he but perestroika had not begun. You know, so the Soviet Union was still the Soviet Union. There was no reform. There was a sense of stasis. Um, immovability. Um, Leningrad itself was falling apart. It was, um, you know, the, you, could, the, you could sort of smell the sewage walking down the streets. The paint was peeling off the buildings. You know, these very, very grand buildings were kind of crumbling away. Um, the people who you met, um, on, if, even walking down the street, if once people, I spoke Russian at that time. In fact, I was there to study Russian. Um, but you would meet people on the street, you would ask for directions or something, and people would 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 do a kind of double take because they weren't used to hearing foreigners or especially you know foreigners speaking Russian, and they, you know, some people didn't want to talk to me. They would they would scurry away. Um, I mean, and this was the remnants of you know years earlier. It could be dangerous to have foreign acquaintances in Stalin's Soviet Union. Um, but I did make friends there. Um, inevitably, I was drawn to, or people were drawn to me, who were somehow against the system. Um, there were, there were, at that time, there were a lot of um, Jews actually in Leningrad who were trying to leave the country. This is the moment of the, um, you know, the, the kind of Jews trying to get to Israel, or get to the United States. I met some of them. Um, I had a very amusing encounter with a Leningrad pop star who. Um, upon being introduced to me, said, do you know David Bowie? And I said, you know, no. And he said, well, I do. And, you know, he talked all about meeting David Bowie when David Bowie, had, I don't know, he gave a concert in Leningrad or he was visiting Leningrad. So, you know, it was kind of from one extreme to the next. Um, but for me, you know, coming from prosperous America in the middle of the 1980s, um, going to Leningrad was really like walking through a looking glass. I mean, so many assumptions that you make about your relationship to the state or even your relationships to other people. Um, you know, what is the what's the purpose of government, how how society is organized, um, how how the economy is organized. All those things were opposite from from what I'd grown up with. Um, and and it, it you know, it, it, it did two things. I mean, one, it drew me in. I mean, I wanted to explain it further. I wanted to understand further how it meant. I mean, speaking Russian was a kind of magical key. It was like, a, you know, I could get into this weird world that other people um, other people couldn't get into. I mean, then actually years and years later, um, I reflected that it was also a very lucky moment because anybody who came to the Soviet Union a year or two, certainly three years after me, you know, with the same kind of background, studying Russian, doing a, a course at, at the University of Leningrad, which is where I was. Um, anybody who came a couple of years later would have encountered a totally different society. I mean, once Perestroika began glasnost, once people began speaking openly about history and about, about, about politics, you know, so it became a very different place. So I, you know, I really belong to sort of the last generation of Americans who were able to see the Soviet Union as it was um, um, in the, you know, the very last moment of kind of Brezhnevite torpor. And I'm actually quite grateful for that because it's given me an insight into what it's like to live in a repressive society or in a totalitarian society uh, that I wouldn't have otherwise. Besides anything else, what you said there is making a powerful case for students and indeed for people of all ages to travel uh, and to travel not to the usual places, but the places less visited. Um, and so that in 88, uh, you joined The Economist and, uh, and you could presumably have had a number of assignments, but you went east uh, and you were covering um, uh, Eastern Europe before, uh, during and after uh, the Berlin Wall coming down. Uh, formative, um, uh, what, ha what happened to you then? So I should preface this by saying, you know, I'm often asked by students and by younger people what they should do, what they should study if they want to be involved in the world of international politics or journalism. And I always tell them, learn a weird language, you know, <laughs> become an expert in some place that other people don't know, learn Turkish. Um, um, I have, a, you know, learn Kyrgyz. I don't know, learn, learn a language nobody else knows. Um, and I suppose Russian wasn't quite that language, but Polish certainly was. Um, and to be clear, 
I didn't go to Poland as an official staff member of The Economist. Um, I went in the fall of 1988, skipping out on my unfinished doctorate, actually, while you were singing the praises of my academic career. I mean, I should I should shame I, on you. I should say I did not finish my DPhil. I didn't write it. I, I meant to take a year off and spend a year doing journalism before going back, and then I didn't. But um, so I'm sorry to say I left Oxford and I went to Poland and I went as a stringer. Um, in other words, I, th I think I had some kind of stipend from The Economist, like some ridiculous amount of money, like $100 a month or something, um, which was a lot of money in Poland in 1988. Um, and I based myself there and I then they paid me per article. They paid some expenses and then I wrote for lots of other people, too. I wound up writing for The Independent, um, which was then a fairly new newspaper. I wrote for some American newspapers. I did a lot of radio um, and I it was a kind of almost entrepreneurial form of journalism where, you know, I was by myself in my apartment and trying to you know figure out what's going on. And remember, this is an era before the Internet. And not only was it before the internet, it was before, um, before you know, international phones even worked in Poland. In order to call London, um, I would have to order the call in advance. You would have to, you know, or I would like a call, and then 20 minutes later they would call you back. Um, and there was no, no, there was, no, and my articles were often filed by me reading them over the phone to copy takers which sounds now, I mean, just amazingly ancient way of forms of communication, but that's what it was like. Um, and in order to find out what was going on, I had to have stay in pretty close touch with, um, at that time, the sol underground solidarity activists. This is before, this was the Solidarity Trade Union, which was the anti-communist movement in Poland. Um, it was illegal, um, but at that time it was kind of operating semi-openly. I mean, it was illegal, but somehow tolerated. Um, and there was a there was a particular church I would go to once a week in order to get the weekly solidarity. The local it was called Tygodnik Mazowsze, this kind of local um, local weekly. Um, I would go and visit people frequently, um, you know, to find out what was going on. Um, and that was how that was how you got information. There was no there was you know nothing online. Um, very, at the very you know couple of years later you know, the internet first started coming in and then you would connect your computer to telephone wires using these things called crocodile clips. Um, but certainly for the first couple of years I was there, it was much more primitive. Um, but I stayed and I was, you know, really, really lucky. And I only appreciate it again years later how lucky I was that I was there during the collapse of communism. So I was, you know, I watched the, in Poland it was a negotiated end. There were there were sort of negotiations between the government and the opposition. There were some kind of semi-free elections, which the opposition won by a landslide. This is in, in June 1989. And then there was a change of government. Um, and that was really the the change in Poland was really the it was kind of the thing that started the ball rolling. It was like dominoes. Um, and after after Poland, there was Hungary. And then after Hungary, there was um, you know, there was Berlin and then there was Czechoslovakia and so on. And so there was a there was a kind of sequence of events that led to the collapse of communism by the end of the year. Um, and I was I was lucky I, I was there for that. Um, I did with the person who would become my husband. Um, we drove to Berlin in in November 1989 when the wall came down um, in the in the in the subsequent year or two. I also traveled a lot in the region and covered the changes for The Economist and for other newspapers. Um, and, it, you know, it was a, again, I, I, I didn't fully appreciate at the time, you know, it was really wonderful to be a journalist writing sort of on the front pages, but writing about a really happy story, mm. you know, a positive story. Um, because usually front page stories are not happy or often they're not, you know, the thing, the sort of the next big thing that happened were the wars in Yugoslavia and that was not happy. Mm. Um, and then, you know, years later, whatever, 9-11 or the Iraq wars or, I mean, those were, those were not happy stories to write, but the fall of communism really was. And it was a, it was a, it was a really interesting, um, positive time to be traveling around the region. And anyway, so I did that. I was there for three years and then I was hired by The Economist mm. um, to go to London. And I spent then a year at their offices. Um, and the Economist, in its great wisdom, made me then, after this experience, made me their Africa editor, which I did for a year. 
before eventually leaving to work for The Spectator. But I'm really grateful to The Economist because they gave me this opportunity. I mean, I was very young, um, you know, I was in my 20s. Um, and they let me write about one of the great, what turned out to be one of the great stories of the of the 20th century. How did it change you being there on the ground when this um, um, massive event in world history was happening? How did it change you and the way that you saw the world? I mean, I think it gave me, um, you know, we just started out talking about optimism and pessimism. It gave me a great sense of optim optimism um, and the feeling that I write about in my most recent book that um, that you know, the world is on the right track and that, um, uh, you know, that we're all on the same team now and that, you know, Europe is going to be integrated and Poland is going to be a normal country and that we are and that, you know, and that the I mean, I, I wouldn't say I went ever as far as thinking history had ended. I don't think I ever had that feeling about it, but I certainly felt that it was a you know, and it actually wasn't just a feeling. I mean, it was true. It was a really great moment of triumph of liberal ideas, by which I mean liberal democratic ideas. And um, and this was a, you know, really uplifting moment. And for a lot of people that I knew then and later, it was also this positive change. So lots of people I knew had new opportunities open for them. They, you know, if they were architects, they suddenly were in a, you know, they were able to suddenly build new kinds of things. If they were interested in politics, they could go into politics. Um, you know, journalists who were underground journalists could work for real newspapers, found and create new newspapers. And the and the 90s were an incredibly creative moment, actually, in Central Europe. Um, it was also a difficult moment. And, um, you know, and there were, I mean, I think actually the process or, or the experience of really revolutionary profound change, which this really was for everybody, is is very exciting and creative and it's also unnerving um, because some things are lost you know some um, ways of life that you'd had before never come back and some people did feel a kind of loss or sense of i don't mean that people missed communism because they didn't necessarily certainly not in poland um, although maybe that's true in, in some other places but they certainly lost a, a sense of stability and a sense of predictability that life had had uh, before that. And I think that was traumatic for a lot of people. And then a lot of people had to change jobs or switch careers. And that's, you know, it's difficult for anybody, particularly for older people. Um, so, but it was a, it was a, it was a difficult, complicated, but creative moment. Um, and, and I'm, you know, I, I feel really lucky that I, that I got to see the beginning of it and to, and then to follow it in subsequent years. You returned to Poland in 98. But I want to keep on, on uh, Britain, about which you were writing. Uh, and in 2001, you uh, there was a particular celebrated at the time interview with Tony Blair, who had been prime minister for four years. He didn't, or did he, seem to be able to shift history as much as he said he would do and as he would have liked to have done? Um, how do you think that, that the Blair project um, succeeded or not in modernising Britain for the 21st century, which is what it was, uh, if it was about anything, it was about that? So it's funny, so my re so I returned to Britain, um, you know, in the early 90s, and then for a brief period, so I worked at The Spectator, where I was very much in the centre of, it was a kind of world of Tory journalism, that's also described in my new book. Um, and then went to work for the briefly for the Evening Standard as a political columnist. And really what I wrote about was the, the that that 96 campaign and what what was Blairism and who was Blair. And then the interview that you're talking about, I did a few years later. I, I then left went you know, went away, came back um, and had, did this very long interview with with Blair. I mean, I, you know, when you look at it in the longer light of history, um, you know, there the the there. There were important elements of modernization that Blair did, and he did do a lot of thinking, you know, about how to prepare, um, you know, how to prepare the British to live in a complicated world. And he had a commitment to, um, you know, to, to Britain being part of the world in an important way. Um, and I think, you know, it, I, I mean, I actually feel, and this is my, maybe it's my bias, I mean, I feel that he... Uh, that Iraq has come to overshadow his prime ministership more than it should do. I think if you picked apart what he did and some of the things that he achieved, you know, whether it was the child benefit or 
or or um, or other changes. It wouldn't look um, as you know people wouldn't feel as negatively about him as they do. I mean, I do think it's true that there was something he did, which is that he 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 did shift the Labour Party and he occupied the center of British politics. Um, for a long time, you know, for, you know, he was like, you know, 12, whatever it was, 12 years. Um, he he occupied the center of British politics and he therefore left open um, both the left, you know, at a kind of a further left than, you know, and a sort of further right. And he he energized some extremes against him, if you if you see, you know, um, and he he probably didn't. Um, uh, you know, he didn't. He didn't. He didn't think through what the answers to that would be. I think he had an assumption that, um, you know, that because he was in the center, that that was, you know, that it, that that the center was going to hold indefinitely, and that there would be no challenges to, um, you know, to his vision of the world. I think he didn't anticipate enough what some of the challenges might be. And it's a cruel fact of the life of a prime minister that whatever good you might do, your premiership will be overshadowed by the big event that that goes badly, sometimes goes goes well. The global financial crisis did for Gordon Brown, but uh, Iraq uh, totally overshadows. Andrew Adonis uh, has got his official biography coming up. He was talking uh, last month on this series. I, I want to move now to your uh, first major book that won the Pulitzer Prize, Gulag, A History. I've left off your 1994 book, East and West, which was a travelogue. I want to, to, to look at how long that book, Gulag, A History, was in the gestation, Anne, uh, because it was a book uh, that, 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 that changed the, the, the way that people saw history and, and indeed you as a writer. So it's, I mean, that book was a 10 year project. Um, it, you know, it was very ambitious. I, I probably didn't understand when I began how ambitious it was. Um, it began partly out of a, you know, a sense that I, I knew at the time that archives were opening in the, in the former Soviet Union and that it was possible to read things and see things that hadn't been available before. Um, and funny enough, in my previous book, in the, in the travelogue, um, which is, which is just a, you know, it's a um, it's now a piece of history that book because it describes yeah. the era that's gone. You know, the you know the Ukraine and Belarus and and the Baltic states of of 1991. Um, but in that the course of writing that book, I met a lot of people who had been in the Gulag, who'd been surf camp survivors, um, and I and I took a step back and I realized that although I knew about the Gulag, of course, and I knew. You know, I'd read Solzhenitsyn and I'd read um, other Russian writers who'd been there. I didn't have in my head a kind of clear mental picture of what it looked like, the way that we all have about the Holocaust or the way that we have about other great tragedies. Um, and I knew there was new information. I knew that there was this, at that time, there was a huge kind of, um, you know, just, um, you know, burst of new publications in Russian, um, people writing memoirs. Um, people coming out and talking about their experiences, oral histories were being written. Um, and I knew that this was a moment when you could capture this piece of history um, in a way that hadn't been possible before. And I, you know, I never sought to, you know, compete with the Russian, you know, the great Russian memoirists and writers, you know, let alone Solzhenitsyn. But I thought that using documents and using archives that I could write about the history in a different way. You know, I could, um, I mean, more objective is really the wrong word, but I mean, I could write about it in a way that I could not just from the point of view of the of the victims, but also the point of view of the camp commanders and of of you know the administrators and even of Stalin himself, because you could you could read what they thought they were doing. You could read their their descriptions um, in the archives in Moscow. And so this, you know, I launched myself into this project. Um, you know, thinking it might take two or three years, and it did take 10 years. I did do other things at the same time. I was still doing journalism. Um, I had two children while I was doing research for the Gulag, which really horrified my Russian friends who have a, you know, probably justified superstition about when you're pregnant, you shouldn't do anything unpleasant and you shouldn't think bad thoughts, you know, and, so, and there I was, you know, literally in Vorkuta or somewhere in a, you know, in, in some horrible place, uh, <laughs> reading terrible stories. But I don't know, my children have turned out all right, so I think it's probably fine. But but I, I did a lot, I did other things while I was writing it and it was a, um, 
subsequently, I discovered that a lot of my friends didn't really believe I was writing this book. You know, I said I was doing it, but it took such a long time to appear that you know people weren't really sure what I was doing. But but I I I, I did finally put it together. It is a book that uses memoir. It uses interviews because at the time there were enough people still alive who had good memories who I could talk to about the camps, including one or two people who worked in the camp administration. Um, and it uses, above all, it uses archives. Um, I had, again, wonderful luck. I met a fantastic, very odd person, but an archivist in Moscow who helped me a lot. Um, he subsequently died um, of cancer, very sadly, um, rather young. Um, but I spent a lot of time with him and he directed me in various places and he sort of knew where all the bodies were buried. I mean, kind of literally and metaphorically, he knew how to find things. So, um, but it was, you know, that was also, again, you know, this was another moment, the 90s in Russia um, were also a moment when there was so much turmoil and, and everything seemed so open and people really wanted to meet people from the West and a lot of people wanted to help me. Um, whether whether this was the, the archivist in Moscow or, you know, travel. I also traveled around the country. I went to libraries and archives and other, you know, including in Siberia and the Far East. Um, I have a very fond memory of a, it was a kind of local archive um, in, um, in a town, in Arhangelsk, okay, which is a town in the far north. And I knew there were some documents there. And I asked, I walked in off the street and I asked a librarian for help. And and she kind of mobilized. She was like, "Oh, I know what you want." And she spent the whole day getting stuff for me. This is just in a this isn't an archive. It's just a local library. Um, and I really, she just wanted someone to read this, and she wanted me to have it. And um, and there were a lot. I had a lot of experiences like that. Russia was very open at that time, mm. um, and it was also a moment when history had not been politicized. So. The, the fact that there was, you know, people have asked me since, well, you were a foreigner writing about this tough moment in Russian history. Didn't people spy on you or try and stop you? And actually the answer is no. I mean, it was a moment when, I mean, some, you know, American girl wants to read some old papers, you know, lying around, let her do it. You know, there was no, there was no special interest in this, in the subject. It was really only when um, Putin came to power and when he repoliticized history, when he began trying to reshape how Russians thought of their history, um, that many of these topics became taboo again or much more difficult to talk about. But at that time, things were very open and easy to do. And so the book, as I said, it was a long project, but it was it, it took me all over Russia. Um, I met amazing people while doing it. Um, and, you know, again, I'm, I'm, I'm just grateful that I got the opportunity to do it. M much, many of the archives that I used, I should say, are not available anymore. Some, a lot of material has been reclassified or it's just become hard to get, hard to get hold of. So this was really a, you know, a kind of window, you know, it was a moment when things were open, you could get access to things, people wanted to help. And it was, um, you know, it was a, it was really, you know, piece of luck. Indeed, you couldn't have written it now. I mean, it was a superbly timed book apart from uh, everything and everything else about it, Anne. Um, just for those viewers who are much less familiar with the Gulag than with the uh, Nazi um, camps, um, extermination and concentration camps, can you just give a, just a very quick one minute sense about the scale uh, of, of the Gulag? So the, the the Soviet camps were 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 in many ways they were very different from Hitler's camps. Um, they were not designed as death camps. They were work camps, labor camps, and there were actually some Nazi camps that were were similar to them in that sense as well. Um, they existed from the time the Soviet Union came to being in 1918-19. I, I there's a, I have a chapter on the origins of them. Um, during the Russian Civil War, and they last really until the end. I mean, they evolved and changed over time, but they the scope of them. I mean, there are, there are prison camps, and then later there are political prisons in in the Soviet Union from 1918 until until Gorbachev uh, until Yeltsin really ends them um, in the 1980s. Um, and they were also very much part of the economy. I mean, they existed in almost every part of Russia. You could find them. They were attached to coal mines. They were, there were logging camps, there were factory camps, there were collective farm camps. Um, you know, they were, they were very integrated in the economy. It would have been very difficult, particularly at the height of Stalin's Soviet Union, you know, in the 
30s and especially the 1940s, it would have been very difficult not to know that they existed, not to know people who'd been in them. Um, as I write in the book, the numbers of people who are in them is very difficult to calculate because you have to, depends what you mean, because there were different kinds of camps. Um, there was a certain amount of churn. People came into the camps, they were then released. Um, and so the, so although you get numbers that look like 2 million people a year, in fact, if you look over the whole period of time, how many people were in these camps, how many people were in prisons, how many people were in other kinds of labor camps, um, you know, you quickly get numbers like, you know, 15 million, 16 million. Um, and so it is a very large number of people who went through the Soviet penal system um, and had some experience of it. And then, of course, you can some people put the numbers much higher than that. Um, and my numbers are more conservative. Um, but it was a it was a, it was an integral part of how the Soviet Union functioned, um, both because it was a part of the economy. The um, it was how Stalin kind of colonized and exploited the the far north. Um, this is where there's a lot of coal and oil and minerals in the far north. And instead of doing what you would do in Alaska or in, um, you know, instead of moving teams of people in and out of these very difficult places to live, they simply sent prisoners there um, to run them. Um, and they were they were an integral part of the judicial system. So everybody knew that you could end up in a camp like this for breaking the rules and sometimes um, for breaking very, um, you know, very small rules. Um, you could get a five-year camp sentence for petty theft, um, you know, during the war, even for being late to work or for, or for not showing up to work. Um, you could get camp sentences for almost anything. And so it was part of the system of, of, of fear. It was part of why people were afraid of the government, why they were afraid of one another. Um, and it was part of what, you know, led even even decades later in the 1980s, it was why people in in the street in Leningrad were still wary of one another and wary of me. So it was a really integral, really central part of what made the Soviet Union what it was. And responsibility for the closing down of the optimism of Russia um, uh, after um, Brezhnev, how much of that should we lay at the feet of Putin? So Putin is really representative of a class of people who were disgruntled and angry by the same things that I was, you know, so inspired by, by the fall of the Berlin Wall, by the end of the Soviet Empire. Um, there was a class of people in the KGB. There's a very good recent book about it called Putin's yep. People by Catherine Belton. Um, and they were they were angry by what happened. And already in very early on, in the early 1990s, they were already beginning to plot how to come back to power. Um, and their method for coming back to power involved stealing money um, and stealing the resources of the Soviet Union, laundering the money through the West, through Western financial institutions, bringing it back into the country and buying companies and buying influence and bringing themselves back to power. So I think actually by the time um, Putin came to power, you know, he, 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 he first um, is named by Boris Yeltsin as his successor in, in actually on New Year's Eve in 1999, um, which is when my, my, also when my recent book begins. Um, he, he comes back, when, by the time he comes back, there is a class of people who are already poised to reverse, um, reverse the openness and, and set Russia on a very different path. Um, so he's really the symptom of something. By the time he's in charge, something has already changed. Um, it, it, you know, it began to change already in the late 1990s. So the closing down theme is is one that we'll come back to uh, later on. So you were given a Pulitzer Prize for the book and you are now uh, a um, very celebrated uh, figure on both sides of the Atlantic. From 2001 to 2005, you were on the editorial board of the Washington Post. Uh, did you find the intellectual life in, in Washington on the East Coast of the US more stimulating, differently stimulating to being in London? Differently stimulating. I mean, Washington is such a special place. I mean, I mean, there is intellectual life in Washington, but it's very focused on politics and and um, um, and and policy and how to do things and 
you know, who's up and who's down. And it does, it, it, it is fascinating. I mean, it's a, it's almost its own world. Um, I mean, a world that has now been, you know, very, you know, really turned upside down. Um, but I, you know, I loved Washington, actually. I grew up there, of course, so I, I was, always, I'm always happy to be there. Um, and I, I really loved my colleagues. I, um, you know, I think American politics, um, in a way, even more so than British politics, because it's, you know, because you had the feeling in Washington that you're in some kind of world capital, that you have, you know, what happens here matters everywhere else. Um, it really attracts excellent people. Um, I have a friend who, 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 whose great moment of revelation in Washington was, it was a moment when, um, with the beginning of one of the Chechen wars, it doesn't matter what the date was, but the Russians had invaded Chechnya and he has an email from a think tank in Washington saying that at eight o'clock in the next morning, there's gonna be an emergency breakfast meeting to discuss this. And he, this is a British friend. And he goes along to this meeting knowing that in London, a meeting like that, there would be three people. I mean, who goes to an eight o'clock in the morning meeting? And of course he walks into the room and there are 200 people. And there is just this huge community of people who are interested in the world and 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 care about it in Washington. Um, and I've 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 always found it a really stimulating place. I know a lot of people hate it, particularly New Yorkers, but um, I've always found it an interesting you know um, place to be, just because it attracts, again, so many different kinds of people with so many different interests. Moving on to 2012, another really major book um, on Eastern Europe, the crushing of Eastern Europe, The Iron Curtain. Um, what were you trying to say about that book and, and the uh, in the late 40s, early 50s focus? Uh, what were you trying to, to do there? And why did you come back to that topic when you could have gone anywhere? So that's a You know, in a way, this is my favorite book. Um, it's okay. a. <laughs> It's a because that book was really a product of, you know, it was a reflection on my own experience. So, as I said, I lived through this moment when the, you know, communism was taken apart and all its components were, you know, were, were destroyed. And then people had to reconstruct civil society and democratic society, or that was what they were trying to do um, in the 1990s. And and the and the fall of communism, of course, had seemed so obvious to me. Of course, it would fall. It was such a disaster. Everybody hated it by the 1980s. Um, but I began to reflect, you know, a decade or two later, that I didn't understand very well what it had attracted people to it in the first place. How is it possible for Stalin to come in to this set of really very different countries? Um, the history of Poland, the history of Hungary, the history of Germany, the history of Czechoslovakia, of, of, um, of, of Yugoslavia, of the Baltic states, these are very different places. They'd had different roles in the war. You know, they'd been on different sides. They had different experiences with fascism and with democracy and different, different you know, relationships to the rest of Europe. And yet Stalin came in in, in 1945 and with the Red Army and with the with the NKVD and, and then with all the, the tools that I described in the book, he made them very fast, very quickly into kind of identikit communist countries. And so the question was, how is that possible? What exactly was it? Um, and so, you know, by this time I was living in Poland. I, I've lived there on and off since the, um, you know, since the late 80s. Uh, my husband is Polish and we have a house in, in, in rural Poland. And so the, you know, explaining that society and 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 the, and the society of the neighbors how did why did communism win what were the tactics that it used how did how what, why did all these institutions give in how did how did radio become communized or 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 stalinized um how did what happened what happened in schools what I mean, and the book talks about these different kinds of institutions and what what it was that made it possible to take them over. And one of the really interesting things that I learned and was that, you know, the Red Army's first priority, so as soon as the Russians arrived anywhere that they occupied, was wasn't just, of course, it was propaganda, it was it was the radio, which was the most important form of media then. Of course, it was secret police, and they in some cases set up secret police's forces even before getting there. But even more important than that, it was what we now later came to call civil society. So, you know, things like youth groups. I mean, you wouldn't think, you know, Russian police officers arriving in East Germany in May of 1945 
would care about youth groups, but they did. Um, and they cared a lot about spontaneous organizations that were at that time kind of coming out of the woodwork. And they immediately sought to crush them. Um, and this was the clue to how it was that the communists and other totalitarians perceive spontaneous social organizations, civil society. Um, and, and this is why those things became so central to their um, to their to their form of totalitarianism. Then it also begins to explain some decades later why um, why the revival of spontaneous organizations, you know, through the dissident movements um, across the region, why those were so effective at undermining communism, because they they proved that totalitarianism didn't work or wasn't effective um, despite the propaganda. Um, and so I found it, a, I, I loved writing that book and I loved the travel I did for it. I went all over the region. I went to archives of art museums and I worked in the Hungarian film archives. Um, and I, I, I did a lot of interviews of all kinds of people who'd been teachers or, or, or writers or politicians in that period who, and were still alive. Um, and, you know, learned a lot and actually maybe we'll, if we've got time, we'll talk about it. And one of the, the sequel to that book would be a book about democratization. Well, we'll, you know, we'll come on to that. But yeah, what, yeah. just very quickly, was it your most uh, uh, original book? Oh, it, I don't know. I mean, no, I think all my books are. Uh, uh, so, so, so let's come on to democratization. So you, you come back and, and you, you're working for a time at the Gartam Institute. Uh, in London on transitions to democracy uh, and this becomes a, a real passion uh, and how far uh, what did you learn about what people can be done to steer countries to democracy and are some uh, countries like Iraq uh, maybe uh, simply not uh, uh, they, they don't have the political culture and traditions of democracy in in their blood w what did you learn Anne? So I don't think you can steer countries to do anything. Um, <laughs> and the, the programs that I was doing sought rather to share experiences. So, um, and for example, I ran a program, you know, called The Future of Iran, in which I got a lot of, a lot of people from the Iranian diaspora together with um, people who had lived through and worked on political transitions in other countries. And this was a this was a kind of ex intellectual exercise and it wasn't we weren't planning the revolution, you know, on the contrary. The the idea was to was to think, okay, what if magically or unmagically or however it's going to happen, you suddenly got a chance to change the political system. What would the obstacles be and how would you do it? Um, and the, and it was a it was a fascinating process and the papers from that project we 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 had I mean I had for example a Chilean come in and talk about judicial reform in Chile after the transition in that country and I had a Polish you know someone Poland come in and talk from Poland talk about um, fighting corruption um, and we we did it we did a whole series of, of projects like that um, and the papers from that project were at the time I mean I've 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 lost touch now and I don't know but they were they were the most downloaded thing at one point that that little little think tank produced um, and I've since I've since been asked for them and have given them to to Iranians who 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 find them interesting. Um, and so the point of my of the exercise was to was to find ways of sharing experiences so that people would have ways of thinking about the problems that they were presented with. because although, of course, I don't know, the first day of, you know, post post, you know, um, post Islamic Republic Iran will be, totally different from anything that's ever happened anywhere in the past, it will, there will be some kinds of challenges that will be familiar from the fall of communism or from the transition in Chile. There'll be some similar ways of thinking. Um, and I mean, certain kinds of problems like how do you reinvent a free press from scratch or how do you, you know, what's the, what is, what kind of legal system do you need to protect free speech? You know, some of these things people have thought about before in other contexts and so what i was trying to do in, in different ways was was share some of these things and i you know i i think um you know some of the projects you know i hope i i hope were useful um i mean look democracy you know the the mistake that we've all made about democracy and this maybe we'll we'll get into it if we have time to talk about my new book you know is to imagine though that it's one um you know that it's a you know, it's a, you know, you can have it or you can't have it depending on some rules, or if you do have it, you'll never lose it. 
um, it's it's a you know history goes in cycles and countries that seem bitterly divided and are caught up in civil wars do eventually come to you know reconcile and are able to have able to create democratic institutions and countries that have democratic institutions do fail um, and so I, I I I don't I don't rule out the idea that Iraq could be a, a functioning democracy someday um, and they're even you know I'm told there are positive things happening there now so. Um, I don't I don't rule out any country on the base of culture or or destiny. You know, um, I, you know, I don't I don't neither do I think I can offer them some kind of perfect path to power. To, I mean, to, to democracy, nor do I think they're condemned to be one way or the other. I mean, all we can do is share what we know and share experiences in the hope that it can be helpful. I'm going to pass on red famine stalin's war on ukraine published in 2017 which uh was i think still the only you're the only author to win the duff cooper prize twice uh which that book won so you were that was also um just in 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 a sentence or two what were you uh, what were you trying to say in that book so that that book is a history of the ukrainian famine but it's also a history of um, sort of the U Ukraine's relationship with Moscow, originally with S Soviet Moscow, with with Lenin's and then Stalin's Moscow, um, and then you know, and then at the very end, I make some analogies to the present, and it explains why Ukraine was such an awkward problem for the Soviet Union, why it's kind of it was a republic that was too big to absorb. Um, and just Russify, you know, on the other hand, letting Ukraine have some mm -hmm. forms of independence was was very, um, you know, was was challenging for for the Bolsheviks who feared that Ukrainian nationalism would eventually undermine their own system. So it's a book about I mean, the, the subtitle of the book is, you know, it's called Red Famine, Stalin's War on Ukraine. So it's about the famine, which was an event that took place in 1932, 33 but also about the politics and the history that led up to that and then some of the politics that followed it. Um, so why why it was that Stalin sought to crush the Ukrainian peasantry, to crush Ukrainian nationalism and create this artificial famine. And of course, it's also about the tragedy of the famine itself, which was not caused by drought or by any of the normal things that cause famine, but was caused by the deliberate collection of and withholding of food. So people were deliberately starved to death. And the book attempts to explain what was the mentality that led to that? Why was it possible? Um, would it's, why, why did Stalin do it? And it, it's a, you know, I, I hope that it's a book that's useful for people who are trying to understand how, you know, you know, contemporary Ukraine and its relationships with Russia as well. It's a fascinating book. My own father's family came from Ukraine. It, it, it's a wonderful book, which I commend. We're going to move on, though, to uh, Twilight of Democracy. And 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 um, I mean, it's a book you you you, you take such big themes. Um, uh, uh, many books uh, inevitably are, are looking at, at at smaller pieces. You look at the big cross cutting themes of uh, of the modern age and, and the, the 20th century and try and explain and understand what's happening. Um, how far do you think that you solved the question that you were posing in that book? You might say, what question was I trying to pose? Yes, I mean, actually, I don't think Twilight of Democracy solved anything. Um, it was not, it's a, so this is a book that is really completely different from the three history books we've been talking yeah. about. Um, it's very subjective. Mm. I am a character in the history that I describe, so I have biases and I lay out the biases. Um, it describes some of people I know, some friends of mine, some acquaintances, people that I was in touch with or knew when I was younger or even, even more recently. Um, and it tries to explain an evolution that I saw in British politics, in American politics, in Polish politics, even in, in the politics of other European countries. Um, particularly on the center right and the kind of anti-communist right, which it's you know at some point in the 2000s became radicalized and became bored with the centrist politics of people like Tony Blair or John Major um, or or Barack Obama or even George W. Bush and began to look for something more radical and. The book tries to explain 
um, or give some explanation, a sort of set of explanations for why that is, some some personal, some more general, some ideological, um, and just and to show how some of the things happening in these different countries are related to each other. So it's a kind of description of an intellectual change that I myself lived through and, and witnessed. Um, and it doesn't, you know, it isn't based on archival research in the Soviet archives or, you know, hundreds of documents. I mean, it really is personal. Um, it's based on my memories, my reporting um, and my reading. And I mean, one of the things I did when working on it was I, I asked myself, when are some moments in history when this has happened before? So when have when have groups of people who were sort of more or less on the same side split or polarized or or, or begun to oppose one another? And I read up on the Dreyfus trial, which is a famous moment that sort of divided uh, nice. the French ruling class. And I read up on you know the 1930s in Europe and 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 other moments in history. And so the book uses some of those eras as well as a kind of light contrast. Um, with the present, but it doesn't offer a solution. It's more of a warning that, again, that that politics is cyclical, that there isn't a kind of single moment of upward progress and everything gets better and better, um, and that um, democracies can can decline and fall as well as you know as well as rise. Uh, and did the circumstances create Trump, or, or has Trump magnified? Uh, the circumstances you're going to be going on and writing a lot about this in the next six weeks leading up to the November uh, election. Um, uh, leaders, uh, we we look at we look a lot at their agency and think they're free, uh, yet they're often heavily conditioned by the by the underlying substrata of ideas. Um, and I love you everything you write about that substrata. Uh, the role of individual agency, how significant is Trump? How significant has Farage been in this country? So, I mean, I think Trump is both the product of changes. I mean, his presidency is possible because of um, of a decline of faith in, in democratic institutions, because of rapid economic change, demographic change, and also, I think, informational change above all, the change in the way that people learn about politics and learn about the world through the internet rather than in in, in older ways. Um, and I think he's both the product of it and also I think he has accelerated a lot of things himself. I mean, I think he has um, really profoundly corrupted the Republican Party in ways that it wasn't corrupt the way before. And he has changed the way in which you know, um, Republican leaders think about themselves and their relationship to their voters and to and to American institutions. So, I, I mean, I think he has he's had a really profound effect on the country um, and on the voters. Um, you know, I, I mean, I, I suppose having been a you know fan of Russian literature, um, you know, I'm, I'm more Tolstoyan and that I do think there are these big changes and individuals, you know, can suddenly play roles, but they also are are themselves swept up by by events. And I as, so as I say, I think he was the he was the result of of deeper changes um, that he's now accelerated. So I'm going to finish um, uh, with three very short questions. And um, are there leaders in the world today who you admire and look to with optimism? Uh, Merkel is on her uh, way out. Um, are there the big people uh, akin to those big figures in history who have stabilized the world and reintroduced the blood of sanity into political life? And if so, uh, who, who, who are you optimistic about? Biden? So of course I admire Merkel. I mean, she's a you know she's an extraordinary historical figure. I have probably more time for Macron than many French people do. I think he's also <laughs> he's, he's recognized that the world has changed in some ways, and he's he's trying to prepare his country and Europe for it. I don't know if he'll be appreciated for that or whether he'll lose his job at the next election. But um, but I, I I think he's he's somebody who who thinks deeply. I mean, I also think that in democratic politics, there are a lot of good people around. Um, you know, there are a couple of really great American senators. They aren't, you know, they aren't headline winners, but they're, you know, they're very effective. Um, there's, a, there's, I mean, uh, we, we want to name names. There's a, there's a great senator from Rhode Island called Sheldon Whitehouse, who's very Absolutely. interested in, um, 
in in kleptocracy and money laundering and is you know is thinking a lot about how to make capitalism more civilized um elizabeth warren is somebody who has i don't know if she would have been a great presidential candidate but she's also someone who's tried to think think you know about those things i think she's a really interesting figure um you know in 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 i mean in germany there's i was just today watching an interview with one of the people who's candidate to be the next chancellor um norbert rutgen who's the head of the um um, Bundestag Foreign Affairs Committee, and he's a he's also a deep thinker who thinks a lot about Germany's place in the world, Europe's place in the world. Um, Ursula von der Leyen, the new EU um, 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 president, is another person who's who spent a lot of time. I mean, so there are a lot of people around, not necessarily doing heroic, I don't know, um, superpower type jobs, but just a little bit one level down. Um, who are running committees? Who are um, who are who 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 do understand the world well? And I think and, and I, I'm hoping they'll they'll play a role in it. I mean, what worries me a lot about contemporary politics is the, you know, the the demand that people now have for charismatic leaders and celebrity leaders, um, and that is dangerous because people who are charismatic and are celebrities are not necessarily good administrators or thoughtful people who can, you know, work together with their colleagues. And one of the hopes I have for a Joe Biden presidency, if it happens, which of course we still have no idea, is that he will be boring. You know, he will be, you know, tepid, you know, he will calm everything down, you know, and we can talk again about how to fix things and how to, you know, what government should really do and and not be caught in this endless culture war, you know, that, that people find so emotive and, and exhausting, but, but compelling. And now I really am going to ask you, Anne, to get this down onto one word. A, a, a writer, a thinker who has particularly influenced you in a sustained way throughout your, your intellectual life. Hannah Arendt. <laughs> Anna Arendt. And uh, now, where do, finally of all, where do you feel uh, most at home? Um, uh, in, in, in Poland, uh, somewhere else in East Europe, in, in London, in, in, in Washington? Uh, w w where is Anne Applebaum most herself? So I'm a native Washingtonian, but I am now most at home in my house in the Polish countryside. It's the it's the house my husband and I built. It's um, we we it was a it was a ruin that we renovated. You know, every doorknob in it was picked out by us. Um, our children grew up there. And I think that's where I'm now most at home. That's a wonderful moment to finish. Anne Applebaum, thank you very much for being our guest tonight. Um, Sunday night, uh, very different on St. Paul, um, but and next week. But Anne, thank you very, very much indeed. Thank we you so it. much. Oh, well, thank you. <laughs>